Hello, everyone, and welcome to Southern College Optometry's July webinar on Mastering the Admissions Interview. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you all are staying safe and healthy. My name is Avery Cunningham. I am a Student Services and Admissions Officer here at SCL. I am one of the admissions team members who answers your admissions questions and participates in the admissions process. Before we get started, I ask that we all use proper Zoom etiquette by keeping microphones muted and less speaking limiting background noise and respecting all of this webinar's attendees and facilitators. We will have time for questions towards the end of the webinar, but in the meantime, if you do have any questions or concerns that need immediate attention, please use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen to communicate with us. Today, Mr. Joe Hauser, Vice President of Student Services, will be discussing the SEO admissions interview and how students can best stand out during the admissions process before, during, and after the interview. Yes, can, can, everybody, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great, great. Uh, well, thank you for um, participating. Believe it or not, we are already starting the uh, receiving of applications for the 2024 uh, entering class. For those of you that that might be uh, earlier in your college careers, uh, the OptomCast opens up around July 1 of each year for the uh, about 14 months later uh, to start up for the uh, the following in entering class. So. We're already getting uh, some applications and considering interview invitations um, as we as we speak. Um, so as far as uh, um, Avery, do you want to do the next slide? Um, we kind of call it the 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 big three uh, as far as the uh, interview essentials. Um, We'll we'll go into a little bit later uh, as far as the the day itself, but it is a one on one, what we call a blind interview, meaning that the faculty member interviewing you will not have your transcript in front of them. Will not have read your application. Um, it's and it's just one person. We feel that makes it more conversational, and hopefully it relaxes you uh, a little bit more. Uh, because we want it to be uh, much more of a conversation. If um, if you talk to your optometrist, uh, whether you're shadowing or working uh, in the field, you know, ask him or her about um, communicating with patients while they're doing the exam, and you probably have observed that uh, yourself. So the the one of the things that we try to make the interview is making it a little bit more uh, similar uh, to what it would be like you as the future doctor uh, seeing a patient. So we like to um, uh, we like to ask open-ended questions of talking about your optometry experience, um, your shadowing, your work experience. The more that you have to talk about, i.e. the more that you've shadowed, the, the more diverse experiences you've had. If you've had multiple sites, that's always better. Um, that re usually relays to the interviewer uh, a commitment that you're not, um, the fact that you're here today uh, is a demonstration of your commitment. Um, but uh, talking about your experience, talking about your shadowing or work experience and the different kinds of settings is a very common question uh, on, the, on the interview. Uh, do you have the discipline to succeed? And a lot of that, we would not have expected you to have had the academic rigors of a professional program yet because that's what you're striving for. But um, to be able to talk about um, what you have done as an undergraduate student and also time management, um, talking about the, the, the low academic loads that you've taken, but along with that, have you worked or involved with, with outside activities? There's not a right or wrong answer or a formula, but we typically like to see uh, some time management, because if you have managed your time in undergrad, that usually translates better into uh, your ability to uh, manage that uh, in optometry school. And then finally, have you thought this through um, as far as healthcare and optometry? Uh, talk to your optometrist about your state laws. Uh, all 50 states 
in the U.S. have different laws and regulations. You, what you can do in Tennessee might be a little bit different than what you can do as an optometrist in Texas, as an example. Um, now, at SEO, we teach to the highest level, uh, but being able to understand that you're not just seeing eyeballs uh, as, a, as a future optometrist, you're taking care of the whole patient and working with other healthcare providers, uh, but then at the same time, you might want to be asking your optometrist and doing research on, um, well, what is the business side of optometry like as far as like handling insurance and billing and coding uh, technology? What's what's changing um, and what will be changing in, in the future? So thinking this through and also comparing optometry to other health fields is perfectly fine on the interview to talk to your interviewer about, well, as a freshman, I was, I was sort of undecided and I, I checked into medicine and dentistry and pharmacy, et cetera, um, and the reasons why maybe optometry surfaced. So all these things can come up in the interview, but what, what we're looking for as an admissions committee is, have you done your due diligence on making sure that optometry is the right field for you as far as experience? Do we feel like you have the academic discipline and the overall discipline of time management? And then have you thought this through as far as we don't want you to come to optometry school in three weeks into school, say, you know what, this isn't for me uh, and, and quit. Uh, that's a that's a lose-lose proposition for everyone involved. So those are basically the three things that we're that we are looking for uh, from the admission side. Okay, talking a little bit uh, about experience. In fact, when I do interviews, this is usually one of the first questions that I'll ask, uh, is this talk to me about either working or shadowing? Um, and if, you, if you've primarily been in one practice, which sometimes is the case, before you come for an interview, I highly recommend um, maybe trying to get even if it's just for an afternoon or so trying to get in with one or two other practices because it 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 always comes across more convincingly if 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 I ask you on a on an interview question talk to me about your your shadowing or experience in the field and you and you say well I've I've shadowed or work in one office that's a great start but that's maybe not as compelling as well, along with working or shadowing with my primary um, optometrist, Dr. X, I've also shadowed Dr. Y and Dr. Z. And that gives a greater um, breadth uh, and diversity of experiences. Probably, as you already know, optometry can be practiced in so many different ways. I give the analogy of if you're applying to medical school and the only MD experience that you've ever uh, experienced, let's say, is a pediatrician. Uh, and the medical admission board might say, well, you haven't shadowed primary care or, or OBGYN or ER or cardiovascular, et cetera, et cetera. So maybe not the greatest analogy, but I use that uh, uh, comparison so that the more practices that you've seen, it also gives you and the interviewer more to talk about. Uh, maybe, well, tell me the differences in the practice that you've seen. It, it creates more of a conversation which makes it, um, um, which makes the, the conversation typically go better. Um, the, you know, you can talk about how, what kind of the impressions was made. Uh, sometimes if you haven't had this discussion already with you, any of Thomas you've shadowed, talk to him or her about the scope of the profession. In other words, if you're from Ohio, what can an Ohio optometrist do and not do? Uh, because again, Different states do have different uh, thresholds or uh, or boundaries. Um, maybe even talk about the the difference in technology uh, over the last 10, 15 years in so many different ways. Not just technology with patient care, but even like how how the practices run with billing and coding, uh, electronic records, etc. So these are things that when I'm interviewing somebody, I'm always impressed. Uh, when they have had some experience and 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 observation in those areas that can and can talk about that, and then finally, there's and again for this one, there's not a right or wrong answer uh, to this question. Um, one of the, one of the great things about optometry 
is that you can be a generalist and see anything and everything that walks through your door, or you can sort of self-select a specialty interest area, but whether that be geriatrics or vision therapy, pediatrics, ocular disease, et cetera. So again, there's not a right or wrong answer uh, to that question, but um, if if I'm interviewing someone and I ask them, hey, if you, can you think about what you want to do uh, when you graduate um, and or or have you had different experiences um, and the applicant says, yes, I've shadowed a little bit with a vision therapy uh, specialist. I've I've shadowed in an OD in optometry ophthalmology practice and observed some uh, laser surgical procedures. These are all it shows me that the applicant may have a greater depth or, or breadth of exposure, which is something we always look for. Okay, do you have the willpower uh, to succeed? Um, four years of optometry school, it, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And we're very proud at Southern College Optometry that we have a little over a 98% graduation rate, which is phenomenal, partly because we admit very smart students. Um, but one of the things I think SEO does also in, in extraordinarily well, some great support systems, and also even in the admissions review, we like to assess um, you as a person, not just your GPA and your OAT. So what do we mean by discipline and like work-life balance? Um, maybe questions would come up on the interview. Well, what do you do in your downtime when you're not in class, you're not studying, and you can talk about your interests, your hobbies, or uh, um, situations like that? Um, high pressure situations, whether that be as a student, it might be, um, boy, if I don't do well on my final exam, I'm not gonna get the grade that I want in my class. But there will be pressures in optometry school because of the volume. Um, it's not so much that each individual course is more challenging than courses you've had in undergrad, but I think a great example is think about some of the toughest courses you've had in undergrad. Maybe that be biochemistry or microbiology, or organic chemistry, physics. Well, instead of taking one or two of those courses uh, at each semester, you're taking five, six, seven. Uh, so it's not that the individual courses are more challenging. It's just, again, the sheer volume. So that is a time management or a situation that sometimes uh, students have not, never experienced. So we like to see um, how you, as a person, handle stress, whether it be working out or spending time with friends or making sure that you have a, some downtime, support from family uh, and friends, et cetera. Um, adaptability and dealing with change. That, that, that covers a lot of topics. It's geographic uh, for most of our students. Uh, we have 136 entering class and usually maybe five or six are from Memphis. So 97% or so, 98, six, um, are come are moving uh, from their hometown or city to Memphis. So that's a change. Um, going from a university of 30,000 to a, an optometry school of 530, that can be a change. Uh, small town to city or a very large city to a smaller city. So these are all things that we want to make sure uh, that you're aware of and uh, are prepared for. But also the learning style um, in optometry school, a lot, probably a lot more critical thinking than maybe you have had in undergrad where it might be a little more memorization. Um, now that's important, uh, mind you, but one of the shifts from undergrad to optometry school, or even from like year one in optometry school to years two and three is incorporating the data that you have learned slash memorized and applying it in a critical setting. Uh, one of our senior uh, professors retired now, I love what he used to say, um, a patient does not have A, B, C, D stamped on their forehead. Meaning uh, when you're going through an eye exam, it's not like multiple choice. 
and stamp on the patient's forehead are the options. You're thinking on your feet and you are um, having to assess, which is a different, possibly a, a different learning style than maybe you have had up to this date. And when we say ability and willingness to sacrifice, that it does, it's not draconian. Uh, what we mean there is you may not have as much time uh, with your friends, family, hobbies, interests as you have had in undergrad. It's important to still have those. But instead of um, going three, four times a week to um, X or Y or whatever entity you may have, you may maybe only able to go once or twice a week. Um, you typically, certainly with, with technology, you have so many different options of communicating with your families back home, but going back home every weekend really isn't a viable option because you're using that time to study. So there are some things. Now, when we say all this, the field of optometry is so wonderful and provides a great opportunity. It's worth the sacrifice or the time, <laughs> excuse me, but it is, it is something that you want to be mindful of because again, you can't really go to optometry school and become a doctor and spend 30 hours a week um, also with a hobby or, or other interests. So there's things to keep in mind. All right. Have you done your homework? Um, we talked a little bit about, do you understand the commitment uh, involved? So I won't really go too much into that. Uh, do you have realistic ideas regarding healthcare optometry or critical issues? So relating to like, do you have a good understanding? Um, it, it's kind of hard to think, oh, I, I'm choosing optometry because I bet I can work uh, 20 hours a week and make $500,000 a year. And that's probably not the case. Um, or I'll never have to work a Saturday in my life. Um, well, even if your practice isn't traditionally open on Saturdays, and most are, not all, but most, um, you will have at times on calls. Now, it's certainly not to the same extent as like an, uh, an ER doc or an OBGYN or other forms of healthcare. But emergencies do, do occur uh, in the evenings and weekends where uh, oftentimes the doctors in a practice will share um, their on-call service. But again, um, we just want to make sure that you're, you're aware of some things. And this is, again, the, where it benefits so much of your shadowing diverse practices to get a better idea of firsthand saying, yeah, Dr. Smith rarely comes in on a Saturday, but occasionally does, or occasionally has an on-call, or occasionally has an evening call. Um, it just kind of gives you that a better perspective. And again, having a working knowledge of healthcare systems, uh, again, optometry and ophthalmology, optometry in primary care, nurse practitioner, physician's assistant, work all together. You, you probably uh, known this already with your own research in the field, but optometrist diagnose type 2 diabetes more than GPs uh, because oftentimes if an adult uh, uh, becomes a, a type 2 diabetic, they probably aren't aware of it, but a basic eye exam uh, would pick that up. So um, obviously if you were to detect that in an exam, you're then your follow-up is to make sure that your patient uh, is also going to go back and see their family care doctor or GP or specialist to work on their blood sugar levels and managing because sometimes uh, their diabetic condition is what's contributed uh, to maybe the eye issues that's caused them to come see you. So again, having a good understanding of how healthcare in general uh, works gives again you a better understanding of how an optometric physician and optometrist uh, works in that same system. Okay, the admissions process, and some of you may have already started this process. The OptomCast uh, cycle starts usually July one of each of each year, so it's been about three weeks now. 
that the cycle has been open. Uh, you are all schools of optometry, all 23 require the OptomCast application. We have a supplemental application, which should only take you like five or 10 minutes. This is directory information uh, that we ask for. The earlier you apply, uh, the better. We are on a rolling admission. Uh, so, um, uh, so one of the common questions we get is I have everything, but I'm lacking one letter of recommendation, or I'm taking the OAT on September 15th. Is there any reason for me to apply before all those items are in? And the answer to that question, 99 times out of 100, is yes, go ahead and apply, because it usually takes about two weeks for your OptomCast application to become verified, validated, and then when that last piece of information, whether it be an OAT score or a letter of recommendation or anything like that, we can act upon your file much quicker. So your app, once you once you apply, your application is processed and evaluated, and that's usually by uh, several of us in the admissions uh, team um, doing an initial review uh, is step three. Also, with step two, if there's anything lacking, uh, our office will notify you. Uh, of that as far as um, if there's something that just looks, uh, hey, we need to we need to address this. Uh, step four, as far as selection and invitation for an admissions interview, this will be emailed uh, to you uh, once those are, are made. Now, if you've applied, let's just say like if you've applied to date and you have not received an interview invitation, that doesn't mean that we're not going to. It just with a rolling admission, we can only ask so many um, at a time, but you're not lost in the queue. Uh, it's continuously reviewed, and you can always engage us with um, in the admissions office as far as, hey, I submitted my application three weeks ago. Um, I just was wanting to, to check and see uh, how my file looked. Do I need to do anything to try to improve my file, et cetera? Step five is actually coming to campus for the admissions interview. We do a, the occasional virtual interview. Uh, but we do we do strongly recommend uh, coming to campus. There's just not a a replacement uh, for being on campus and seeing the campus, seeing the facilities, seeing our clinic and classroom and labs, interacting with our students. In my opinion, there's there's nothing virtually we can do to replace your having the vibe or feel of, hey, I belong here. I, if, if accepted, uh, this is where I think I, I, I feel the most comfortable. Uh, so we strongly uh, recommend uh, coming. But the on-campus interview is the, uh, the fifth step. And then finally, the admissions committee meets. And typically, interviews are on Fridays and then the occasional Mondays in September. And the admissions committee meets on Tuesday. And we do something kind of old school. Uh, after we meet as a committee, we pick up the phone and call you uh, to let you know uh, about your admission status. So we do try to meet very promptly, very quickly after the interview timetable while everything's kind of fresh on everyone's mind. So once you interview, uh, you should be you should hear back from us uh, in just a matter of days. Apologies, everyone. I think our Wi-Fi went out here temporarily. Uh, Mr. Hauser, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Okay. All righty. Let's get back on track. All right. If you can see the screen, um, you're welcome to yes. continue. Very good. Well, let's go to the next slide. Okay. The cycle, which is kind of similar to... Um, we talked a little bit about, uh, you're invited for the interview. And on the interview day, when I say psycho, this is really more about the interview day more than anything else. Um, the blind interview I, I referenced earlier, it's a one-on-one -on -one, uh, closed file or blind file. Again, meaning the interviewer will not know what your GPA is, uh, what your OAT score was, where you went to school. Um, again, one, it, it, it eliminates bias. And two, um, if they're if they're not if they don't have your transcript or OAT scores in, in front, 
it, they can't, they're not going to harp on, hey, let's talk about this one C you made your sophomore year, or let's talk about this one section on the OAT that's lower than others. We, uh, we're we going to be able to evaluate your file as an admissions committee. Uh, it, 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 this, it is what it is. And, and certainly, if you have anything about your file that is um, that needs explaining, you will certainly have that opportunity to do so. Uh, on the interview, but we just don't want the focus of the interview to be kind of like you're defending your file, uh, for lack of better words. So the blind interview, the interview is much more talking about optometry and you as a person and your goals. Um, in fact, we won't even talk a little bit about, um, um, like one of the questions I like to ask is looking for in a school. Remember that we're interviewing you, but you're also interviewing us. Uh, so don't hesitate to ask questions with your with your interviewer, uh, whether it be about their take on, on optometry and or SEO. And th then sliding into the counseling session, uh, this is technically not interview part two, but it, you're, you'll be you'll meet the interview might be about 45 minutes on average, 45 minutes to an hour. The counseling session is about 15 minutes. And it is going over your open file, looking at your transcripts and outscores and letters of recommendation. Um, if there's anything lacking in your file, any missing prerequisites. Um, again, if you have a, a question or would like to talk about maybe that one semester that wasn't as strong as others, it, this is a wonderful opportunity uh, to do so. But the counseling session is meeting with an admissions officer to kind of go over the nuts and bolts of your file, making sure everything's in and when you can expect to hear from us. Uh, on the interview day, you will also have a financial aid and housing session. It's it's actually over lunch uh, on campus where um, someone from the admissions office will talk about housing. We do not have dormitories at SCO, but uh, about 83% of our students live within 10 minutes of campus. So we can talk and, and you'll also hear from students uh, that will talk about where they live and what they were looking for. And you also have a financial aid presentation, very basic, uh, doesn't go into terrible amount of detail, um, but the the basic items about uh, uh, applying for loans, uh, obtaining loans, debt management, uh, the, the cost that are typically associated with like housing and, and other aspects of living. Uh, and then after the interview day, a recommendation from the interviewer uh, goes to the admissions committee. Like I said earlier, uh, we meet on um, usually on Tuesdays of every week to to um, get back with you just a few days after your interview. Okay, before coming or signing up, this is this is. This might be more my age coming out, um, almost sounding a little parental uh, here. So when you get your interview invitation, you'll usually have several days from which to choose. So don't just get excited and rant, oh, I'm going to pick the very first day. And then you realize, oh, darn, if I go on this day, uh, I need to pretty much uh, drive in, drive out, fly in, fly out, and not spending much time in the city or on um, campus. Um, because we want you to have uh, some time to look on and explore the city uh, and not feel rushed on the interview. So look at look at your travel itinerary. Um, spend some time in the city, uh, if nothing else, to look for housing. And we'll give you a lot of great recommendations. Uh, and you actually will have a, a little tour of the city uh, on the interview day, just the, the area around the campus that will show some of the places where students live, but it doesn't replace maybe driving to some of those areas and maybe even looking at some apartments. Um, whether or not you want to bring guests uh, to the interview day, it's it's there's not a right or wrong answer. I might not suggest bringing six people. Uh, that gets a little crowded and hectic, but if you wanted to bring your parents or a singular parent or a spouse partner, that's perfectly fine. Uh, what to wear uh, for the interview. Um, there's not a specific dress code um, but for the, for, uh, for gentlemen, um, I don't think anyone's ever been offended by someone wearing either a coat and tie or at least a, 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 a button up shirt and a, and a blazer. Um, and then, um, just think about what you would wear to a professional interview. Um, you don't have to put on a tuxedo or, or the finest dress or anything like that, 
but you you don't want to you don't want to get let give your interviewer the chance for a wrong impression. If you're dressed a little too casually, if you're wearing shorts or if you're wearing a polo or or just you're not uh your presentation not as you're uh you're just not as put together as maybe you should, it gives the impression that you that it's you're being a little apathetic. Um and we certainly would you wouldn't want to to do that. And then questions. It's I mentioned earlier, you're interviewing us just as much as we're interviewing you. So at, come with questions, whether it be about what makes SEO stand out, what what are the things that you need to know about SEO? And if if it doesn't come up naturally on the interview day, ask your interviewer, ask your tour guide. You will have opportunities to talk to students without those of us in admissions around. So you'll have that opportunity to, hey, I really want to ask this one question, that, but I didn't want to ask it in front of my interviewer. Uh, so again, feel free to have those questions. Um, and, um, and and the worst thing is, is not asking the question that's important for you. So, so, so potential high, high, uh, often, often fielded questions from interviewers. You know, tell me about yourself. They again, uh, the interviewer wants to know about you and what's important to you, and, and and allowing you to kind of talk about yourself in a comfortable setting will give the interviewer a chance to kind of implicitly see your own communication skills. Um, one thing I didn't mention earlier is our faculty that are assigned to interviews are also patient providers, clinicians in the clinic. They will work with you. So one of the barometers that they might look for in evaluating an interview is, can I see myself working with this student in their third and fourth year in clinic? So that's a, a kind of the reason to talk about yourself a little bit to communicate. Why do you want to be an OD? We, we want to also make sure that you have a realistic expectation of what optometry, and also have you done your due diligence and homework? about optometry. Um, and again, this is not a trick question, or a, but it's often, if you don't get into optometry school, what, what are your plans? Whether it be, well, I'll plan to apply again, or I'll, I'll think about another field in, in healthcare. Again, not a right or wrong answer, but a question that some of our interviewers ask. Um, and then I'll, also, um, Usually at the end of the interview where the interview will give you the opportunity if there's anything you'd like to add or share that, again, didn't come up in the interview and or if you have any questions of them, it's very appropriate. In fact, it's encouraged uh, to ask the interview, even if it's Dr. X, where did you go to optometry school and what's the difference between SEO or if you went to SEO? Um, what do you think about the school? So there's, there, there's perfectly uh, what, what is it like living in Memphis? Uh, the interviewers are very open uh, to fielding any questions that you may have. So how to connect um, with, your, with your interviewer. One of the things just in life, um, putting yourself, the empathy, putting yourself in the other person's shoes, uh, one of the great ways of thinking about how can I do well in an interview, put yourself in the shoes of the interviewer. Um, how the first little bullet there, what will make it easier for them to fill out their evaluation? Well, if you if you answer all the questions very succinctly, yes, no, or or not really elaborating, well, that's going to make it harder for the interviewer to um, uh, to assess your conversation skills. Now, conversely, if you talk, um, you know, if it turns into a two-hour interview, uh, that could be a negative too. Because so you want to, you and also don't avoid the question. If the if a, if a fact member asks you on the interview, talk to me about the toughest course you ever had in college. Uh, don't talk about the your part-time job. Talk about the toughest course you had in college. Uh, try to address the question that was there. Was the was the exchange pleasant? Usually, ninety nine times out of hundred, it is. But the more courteous and and um, you know, be respectful. Um, I always suggest if your faculty member is introducing themselves, 
uh, refer to them as, like, for example, if you're interviewing with Dr. Erin Kerr and, and she introduces herself as Dr. Erin Kerr, uh, I would call her Dr. Kerr uh, until she may say, oh, no, just call me Erin. Uh, but initially, uh, I think uh, it's always courteous to refer to the to, to the fact of an interview as, as doctor. Um, were you energetic? Um, uh, again, the vibe, did, did the interviewer feel like you were excited to be here um, or apathetic, uh, kind of going through the motions, body language. If, if someone, in my opinion, is sitting in the chair, kind of slumped over or slumped down um, and not really seeming like paying attention, it's kind of like, do they really want to be here? Um, now, again, be mindful. You don't want to be too energetic or, or over the top. Um, but just trying to uh, make sure that you're um, uh, giving the interviewer a strong feeling that you're in, you're very interested. Um, you know, give them something to work with. Did the interviewer have to uh, press you for information? What I mean but really about this is continuously asking a follow-up question. Again, to the, uh, John, Jane, what was the toughest course in college? And you don't answer it. And the, and, and the interviewer has to ask it again because they're going to say, listen, I want, I want an answer to this. So again, if they have to continuously press you, that means you're not really addressing their question. That could be a modest concern. Was the interview fun? Was it engaging? We try to make it very casual and, and, and again, conversational. But part of it is to um, a win-win is when both the interviewer and the, inter and the applicant uh, have an enjoyable experience. And then what is unique about you? Uh, not that it has to be something incredibly significant, but again, if there's something, uh, I think a healthy approach is on the, before you come for the interview day, think to yourself, okay, they're going to know my GPA, they're going to know my OET, um, and there's going to be some things on the application, like in my essays maybe, but what are the two or three things that you want Southern College of Optometry to really know about you and your beliefs and or um, what's important to you is a good thing to say, I want to make sure I convey these in my interview and or in the counseling session, and that usually bodes well. All right. Um, corresponding after, uh, you know, how, you know, should you follow up with the interview is perfectly fine. Um, emails or a little hand thank you notes. Uh, again, um, this is this might be more my age coming out, um, but like for example, uh, it's incredibly courteous and appropriate to send uh, an email or a thank you note to the interviewer thanking them for their time. But again, I would address them as Doctor Kerr, not Hey Aaron. Uh, again, it 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 might it might seem Hey if I if I if I say call her by her first name, it shows that we really connected, and that might be true. But I do feel when you're first learning or know, getting to know someone, it, it's, it's, never, it's never a bad idea uh, to uh, pay the respect or show the respect uh, by saying, oh, Dr. Kerr or Dr. X. Um, and then if you were to send an email, um, it doesn't have to be anything formal but, uh, by any means, but I would, I would, I would try to refrain from it being too casual. Uh, usually texting is a little more casual than email, but still nonetheless, um, you, you know, use proper grammar and spelling. Uh, not that we're weighing on this, but again, if you were to send a quote unquote thank you note email and there's misspellings and improper grammar and very casual language, it, it might it might not provide the intent that you're doing, that you're wanting there. Uh, how to accept, delay, or decline an admissions office, uh, offer. Now, one of the things that um, um, that's unique about SEO, and, and I'm an advocate for this, if you apply an interview and are accepted early, we give you more time than just about any other optometry school as far as the number of weeks uh, to make a decision. Uh, early in the process, it's as much as eight weeks at, at some schools, and I'm not trying to say negative about other schools, 
Uh, even this time of year, they can say, congratulations, you're accepted. You have two weeks to decide to submit a deposit. I think that's way too early, but that's just my own personal opinion. Um, you can accept your uh, accept our acceptance uh, as, as quickly as you want, um, or you can use the full time. Um, however, if you were accepted, and let's say you have eight weeks to decide if you're going to um, 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 accept our offer, especially if you're holding either a, a state contract seat or maybe you've been awarded a scholarship. If you know a week or two after you interview with SCO or you hear back from us, oh, I'm going to go to this school or that school, you know, shooting us an email and letting us know is courteous so that that contract seat or scholarship uh, could be offered to somebody else. Now, if you have, I'm having a tough decision, I really want to make the time, uh, that's perfectly fine. You have you have that you have that prerogative to do so. Um, how to follow up um, on suggestions? Sometimes, um, either for the interview or simply before the interview, or Mike Robertson, our admissions director, may um, reach out to you and say, "Jim, everything about your file looks good, um, but." you don't have as much shadowing as most other applicants and it's only been in one office. So we recommend, and he may even say, um, I have some doctors in your area that might, they're typically open if you'd like some suggestions. So he's happy to work with you on this. Um, we feel it's important because it gets back to the um, reasons for choosing optometry. I kid you not, there have been a few applicants over the years that when we, when Mike would send something like that would say, well, school X or school Y doesn't require me to shadow, so I'm not going to do it. Well, we're probably not going to accept that applicant. Um, because the way we look at it, if we feel like a student has had limited experience in the field and um, you're looking at a 40, 50 year career, is it really that much to ask for that same applicant to maybe go spend another 10, 15 hours uh, and maybe another practice or two over the course of several weeks? So if there is a, a follow-up from the admissions office, um, it's it's always best to acknowledge receiving it and then you know potentially try to do your best to address that. All righty, that brings us to the end of the webinar currently, but now is a great time for questions from any of our attendees. Um, please use the Q&A feature or the chat feature at the bottom of your screen, everyone, and we should be able to see and address your questions. Um, and then, Mr. Hauser, I actually had a question that we typically ask faculty members, but I thought you, you might be um, relevant to, to speak to this as well and offer some insight. Okay. Um, how does the fact that these are blind interviews impact the experience, do you think? Oh, wow, that, that's a great question. And I don't have an exact answer of all the schools, but I think it's, I don't know if it's 50-50, but I would say at least a third um, of the optometry schools have a component of a, of a closed file or blind interview. Um, I hated panel interviews when, back in my day of grad school. Uh, so I, I have a bias, uh, admittedly, um, but the um, I would say that um, one of the things that we just feel that the the closed file or blind interview allows the the applicant to be himself or herself the most. Um, so um, what I would say is. Um, um, just that's the reason for the interview, uh, the style that we do. And, um, the, um, so, uh, yeah, and, and I think it's also kind of part of our personality as a school. Uh, you will get to know your faculty quite well. We have 58, um, uh, faculty and you'll get to know these doctors, these faculty, probably much more than maybe you got to know your teachers and instructors and professors in undergrad. So we just think that the blind 
interview format is more conducive for for that. And I do apologize in advance. Um, my 11 year old dog uh, does bark when anything, and I think I just heard a noise outside. So if you hear any barking outside or barking in the con in the background, it's just it's just my uh, 11 year old golden retriever uh, trying to figure out something. So, um, but hopefully that answered the question. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Um, then we have a question, a couple of questions coming in. Um, will students selected for interviews know who will be interviewing them beforehand? Um, no, um, we do not. Uh, we've thought about this, but occasionally, um, um, occasionally it's, um, it's, um, it changes either because a faculty member is running late from this or that. So, uh, but we typically do not share that information. All righty, and then how would we submit our shadow or work experience when we apply to SEO? Um, well, first of all, it's on the OptomCast application. And there's sections in that's asking you to talk about um, your shadowing and work experience. If you have additional, once you've submitted your application, you can go back and update your OptomCast application uh, at any time, or uh, you could, um, um, or you could um, um, send us an email by simply saying, "I have done these hours." All righty, and then along those same lines, how many hours and settings for shadowing are optimal? Um, I would say at least three offices is ideal to give a good diversity. And typically we like to see, again, optimally, at least 50 hours. Again, this is over time. This is not you know, uh, 50 hours in each office or anything like that. Um, but that would be the um, um, the recommendation as far as um, um, and also when we say diversity, when you go to your second optometry office to shadow, you'll you'll kind of know how similar and how different it is. Uh, and if and if you keep going to some practices that are, are somewhat similar. Um, then maybe even contacting the school to, to kind of assess what kind of shadow you've had. And then we can give some recommendations. It's not your fault as an applicant if, oh, this is the third vision therapist I've shadowed. Uh, and I just didn't know that that was the case. But getting at differences like shadowing a doctor that's in, you know, just a, a one doctor office then maybe shadowing a practice with multiple doctors or a practice where there's optometry and ophthalmology uh, together. Uh, that mixture is always uh, good so that you see that diversity of shadowing. All righty, and then another question. Um, a few other questions, thank you guys. Um, if students retake the OAT, will the highest score or the most recent score be considered more heavily? It's the highest. Um, so like, for example, if I'll, I'll use probably the most uh, common uh, area, a 300 on the academic average is, is just that. It's about the national average. It's, it's an okay score, but it's not a great score. And if a student says, oh, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm asked to take it, I'm worried, what happens if I go down? So if you were to have a 300 and, and it's encouraged to retake, and you make a 290 afterwards, the 300 still stands um, as, your, um, as your official score. Conversely, if it goes up, uh, then, it's, then it's the highest score, not uh, necessarily the most recent. All righty, and then another student asks, do you prefer volunteer hours as well? If so, how many? Um, are we talking about volunteering in optometry or volunteering like extracurricular? They don't specify, but let's assume both. Okay, good. Very good. Um, yes. Um, let's just say from an extracurricular volunteering, whether that be 
with service or or with student organizations on campus or philanthropy or church or whatever. The, it demonstrates time management. It demonstrates service leadership. So that's always uh, looked upon uh, favorably when an applicant has had volunteering um, as far as in their community uh, and or on their campus. Um, if, if, the, if the purpose of the question was distinguishing volunt shadowing versus working uh, as in optometry, they're both, uh, it's always hard for me to say which one is better on that because there are, there are such great positives of both. Working um, in an office is phenomenal, but that may kind of lock you in uh, into one practice, but you get great depth in that practice. The benefit of shadowing or volunteering, uh, you know, a couple hours here and there with different practices means maybe you get to see more practices. So there's there's wonderful benefits of both. Um, I wouldn't say that I have a preference of one versus the other. I do think that if you have worked as a tech uh, or as an um, optometric assistant in the office, it does give you um, maybe a better chance to get to know the optometrist better and, and, and ask him or her more detailed questions uh, and maybe get a better feel of what day-to-day -day life is in an optometry practice. Thank you. And then a couple more questions. Um, when should we expect to start seeing interview invitations? Very soon. Um, um, we're, I, I believe we're, we may have been uh, sent out a few uh, based upon the OptomCast applications that have come through. They've already been verified, validated, uh, and everything. Like I said, I want to mention, like, if you've submitted your application, let's say if you submitted your application yesterday and it's not verified yet, we can't invite you for an interview until that happens. And sometimes it takes uh, some time for that to happen. Uh, but we have rolling admissions, so we're starting interviews uh, next month. So um, um, the earlier you apply uh, and have everything in, like your transcripts and OET scores and everything else, uh, the quicker we can make that determination of inviting you for an interview. Thank you. And then um, how are the three main areas of consideration of GPA, OAT score, and shadowing distinguished by the admission staff in terms of importance? Um, it's it's kind of like the old three-legged stool. Uh, we, we want for you to be strong or stable in all three of the areas. Um, obviously, academics is, a, is an indicator of, of how you'll do in the classroom. Uh, the OAT along the same lines, but also you'll be taking standardized tests in optometry school for national boards. Uh, so therefore, um, right, wrong, or indifferent, uh, to become an optometrist, you have to have a certain standardized test taking ability to pass national boards. So we want to see how you do on that via the OAT. And then, you know, shadowing and other things like communication skills are very important because optometry is a clinical profession. Um, you're, you're going to be interacting with people and talking with patients and showing empathy and sympathy um, and compassion, uh, professionalism. Uh, so therefore, those more subjective components uh, are are vitally important to us as well, whether it be from the letters of recommendation that you receive to just the overall experience of the interview day uh, to, again, the amount of experience you've had shadowing or working in optometry to show a commitment. So they're all um, very, very important. Um, and you can't really, um, you can't really remove one of those areas um, and say, oh, that, that part's not important as long as I'm good in the other two. You don't have to. You don't have to excel in all three parts. Um, so, like for example, if you have a stellar GPA and you have great intangibles and great work experience, you still need to do well on the OAT, but you don't have to score a, a three ninety on the OAT. Um, conversely, if your GPA is a little bit lower for a variety of maybe different reasons, a high OAT can offset. Um, that may be concerned. So um, 
they're all important and they're all factored in. All righty, then I think we'll make this our last question so we can end on time. Um, is an applicant able to submit their application before taking the OAT? Is it possible for interviews to be offered before an OAT score is submitted? Um, it's a yes, no on that one. Yes, uh, you can. In fact, and it's encouraged. Uh, so let's, 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 let's use a, time, a specific timeline. Let's say someone is planning to take the OAT on September 1st, and that that applicant is thinking, well, is there a reason for me to apply before September 1st? My response to that would be go ahead and, and submit your application uh, because it does take time for OptomCAS to uh, process. And uh, you don't you don't want to create a time bottleneck. Um, so you get, let's say you, you submit your application on August 1st or August 10th. And then by the time you take the OAT, everything about your optimum cast file is ready. Also, a little uh, hidden note is that when you take your OAT, for those of you that haven't, you leave the test center with your scores. The schools will not get your official scores for about 10 days to two weeks. So it's perfectly appropriate. Let's say with that example of taking the OAT on September 1st, if you apply sometime in August, and everything's done and verified and ready. And the only missing piece of your puzzle of the puzzle is the OAT. And on September 1st, you walk out of the, of the testing center with your scores. You can email us your scores. It's not official, but we will count that for an initial review. And Mike Robertson, our admissions director, on, on many, many times has invited someone for an interview, uh, even with an, an unofficial emailed OAT score. So that's just an example of um, a reason or a, a, an incentive to submit your application before you take the OAT, if you're, if you're scheduled to take the OAT a little bit later, um, in, versus, okay, I'm going to take the OAT and then start the application. All righty then. So those are all the questions I'm afraid we have time for right now. But as you can see, Mr. Howler's email is on the screen in front of you. So feel free to contact him directly should you have any additional questions going forward. Absolutely. Um, so that brings us to the end of our webinar. Um, I know we have covered a lot of information today, um, but I hope this experience has been of assistance as you start on your optometric journey. Our next webinar will be on Monday, August 21st at noon, and the focus will be SEO scholarships and contract seats. The registration link will be live on the website tomorrow. If you haven't done so already, I invite you to request more information by signing up for our inquiry form. You will receive a personal advisor and a personal brochure with information relevant to your goals and experiences. Thank you to Mr. Hauser for sharing his time and experiences and a special thank you to all of our attendees who have joined us. We hope to see you all at the next webinar in August, but in the meantime, have a great rest of your week and take care.